I also don't think she would have gone too far. It was exceptionally hot today. And you see this beautiful lilac breasted roller. You can tell that it's a little bit on the windy side by how it's having to balance on that branch. It almost keeps to, uh, t going tail over the top of its head. And these are such lovely birds and I'm envious of Brent who got to see a broad build roller. I'm absolutely dying to see one of those so that's something we're going to be keeping an eye out for. And these are incredible birds to watch especially when they're flying around trying to catch insects or when they dive down to the ground and catch a grasshopper. I always think that that's quite amazing. That beautiful white supercilium. It almost looks like an eye, uh, eyebrow, which makes them so easy to identify. And off it goes. Right, that was lovely. Thank you, lilac breasted roller. Did you know that I've only ever got one really good picture of a lilac breasted roller, and that was almost two years ago. It was actually when I first moved up into the sand that I was able to get one. It sat right on the branch next to me. I could almost reach out and touch it. I could not actually believe my eyes. And I thought that as soon as I was going to pull my camera out, this thing was going to fly away. Well, it didn't. It just sat there. I was completely sort of blown away by that sighting. And of course, I didn't have any guests with me, which was very frustrating because it's one of the birds that everybody wants to try and get a photo of. Now it's really nice for you sitting at home and watching because you're able to take screenshots but it's so difficult to pull a camera out, get the focus right or sometimes the bird is too far, you can't reach with your lens. My goodness. <laughs> Jane, I hope that you are very well. Now Jane, you want to know how many birds in this area change their plumage sort of I suppose for breeding purposes goodness I don't think I could give you an exact number I think that it'd be quite difficult oh look a little common dacre did you see it just dart across the road wow my goodness that was not hanging around at all that was so quick and it's normally the sighting that you get is the just the dust that they leave behind off oh, it's gone completely now and uh, sorry Jane so I, I can't I don't think I can give you a number I'd have to physically count exactly how many there were and that would probably take me an hour of paging through each bush but there's quite a few different ones for instance one of my favorite one of the most noticeable is a bird that we were talking about yesterday which is the pintailed wider and actually let's park in the shade here I'm going to very quickly show you a photo exactly of what they look like because it's quite I think it's quite a nice example let's go to W wider there we go 426 I'll say these numbers out loud because if I don't then I forget them okay we that was a little bit on the windy side just trying to get it perfectly and so can you see the bird on the top left that's the male the pintailed wider and like how beautifully it has been framed now that's what they look like when they are not breeding but if you go down a little bit look how long that tail is now that tail those feathers grow only just for the breeding season we normally start to see them breeding actually at this time of the year in fact and of course the female is not quite as attractive but of course it's got that little bit of a pink bill bill sorry which allows them it sort of links them back towards the males. But a lovely looking bird and something that I'll be uh, definitely be keeping out of, uh, keeping it a look out for. But it's lovely, isn't it? Just trying to think off of the top of my head who else does that. But I'm going to have a little think about that, Jane, and try and see who else really changes their feathers quite nicely. Oh my goodness, Wendy. Wendy's acting very sick again. And uh, while I try and work my brain a little bit harder, let's go back across to Byron, who's got some wildebeest. I do indeed have some wildebeest. The other plains game that we have in this area, and we call them plains game because they tend to enjoy open areas 
and have a look at these wildebeest that are enjoying all this green grass at the moment. You can see how lush this little section, this little patch looks. It's beautiful with this afternoon light. And they are enjoying feeding on this vegetation. It's interesting, usually you'll find wildebeest and zebra in the same area. And the wildebeest actually feed on the shorter grass and the zebra usually feed on the longer bits of the grass. So there's actually no competition in terms of food and that's often why you do find them in the same areas. And if you think of East Africa, I know James was up in the Maasai Mara recently and you got to see some of that on Safari Live and you got to see all those thousands of animals and usually you see the zebra and the wildebeest all moving together and even in this area we don't have migrations here in southern Africa we do have some certain or certain annual movements depending on food and water but no migrations and also not nearly as many numbers like you get up in East Africa but you will get herds of wildebeest and herds of zebra often in the same area and it's wonderful to see them we haven't seen too many of the wildebeest around I do think we're probably going to start seeing a lot more of them because there's a lot more food that is starting to grow for these animals. I wouldn't be surprised if these wildebeest came from the Biffles Hook Dam. We're not too far from there. Maybe went and had a drink during the day and now they're all feeding again. Look at that. They are very strange looking antelope, aren't they? And Paula has just sent us a comment, and I was about to say it, and Paula says, wow, these look a lot like buffalo. They do, Paula, they do look like buffalo, but they're not related to buffalo at all. They are completely in the antelope family. They're all part of the antelope family. The wildebeest do have a similar digestive system, though, to the buffalo. They are both ruminants. So kind of related and ruminants are animals that have a four chambered stomach they have a very efficient digestive system so they get as much nutrients as they possibly can out of all the food that they eat but they are not buffalo at all they are completely part of the antelope species or, um, antelope family rather One of my guests once told me, and they said, it looks like the wildebeest has kind of been put together with leftovers from other animals. I'm not too sure how the wildebeest would feel about that, but um, they are strange-looking antelope. Long faces. They're also known as gnu because of that very strange sound that they make. Um, I... I don't know if I can make a GNU sound, um, but their alarm call, if they do have any predators around, or if they, if the males are trying to challenge each other for territory, the males can be quite territorial. They'll give a grunting, snorting sound, which sounds a little bit like a GNU, GNU, GNU. <laughs> and that's where they get the name GNU from. I, I mean, I think... I'm sorry, my, my, my animal sounds are terrible at the moment, so I'm not very good at mimicking them. The only certain birds, maybe lion and leopard, I can get away with that. Um, but we'll, we'll do that another time. <laughs> so it's nice to see all these wildebeest around here. What we're going to do is let's leave them. We're going to carry on. We're not too far from the water hole. And let's see if we get lucky and have anything coming down to drink. But really wonderful to see the wildebeest. Haven't really been able to show them to you in the last few days that I've been uh, out in the open like this. We've seen one or two, but in dense thickets. Right, isn't that great? So let's carry on down the road. Let's go see what's happening at the waterhole. Uh, Leroy has just sent us a question. And Leroy wanted to know what is the lifespan of the wildebeest? Uh, Leroy, they live up until they meet lions. <laughs> it's, it's difficult to give an exact estimate on how long these animals live. And again, because there are a number of predators and that in the area, 
I think wildebeest have a lifespan of around 12 to 16 years, somewhere around there. It all depends on food availability, water. There are a lot of factors that we do need to take into account when considering the lifespan of animals. But somewhere around there, uh, I would say most, most antelope are within that range, 12 to 16 years. Maybe, maybe a bit more if they're really, really lucky and they do very, very well. Okay, let's see what we've got here. I'm almost at the waterhole. Just scanning around, having a good look. Maybe there's something hiding in the bushes around here. Ah, there's something in the water. Our resident hippo. And look at the terrapins sitting on his back. Wow, look at that scar on the back of that hippo. Ah, that is incredible. Now that would be from another hippo. It's not unusual to find hippo with serious scars on them like that because hippo do have territorial fights on a regular basis, especially when water becomes, becomes quite, uh, quite rare and hard to find. Water holes start drying up, then a lot of hippo have to move into areas and they then get forced to spend um, a, a lot more time in, in close proximity and they can get very territorial. Males will fight for dominance, will fight for territory. Often younger males will get pushed out and they'll have to go and find their own little water hole and I wouldn't be surprised if that has happened to this hippo. Now the thing with hippo is they've got massive, massive teeth. They really do. And if they do fight, they can cause serious damage and sometimes death. They can kill one another if they are fighting. And it's interesting to see those terrapins basking on the back of that hippo. The terrapins actually play quite an important role with a lot of these animals. These animals that like to go and lie in the water or get close to the water, uh, like buffalo, uh, elephants, not necessarily, but the elephant do go into the water and bathe and splash, but not like they don't necessarily lay in the water like hippo or buffalo. And what these terrapins actually do is they feed off the ticks. Uh, on the on the hippo, they they eat them and pick them off these animals, so they actually play quite an important role. I think they're using this hippo as a rock at the moment just to sun themselves, warm up. Perhaps the water is a little bit cooler, so they basking in the sun. Isn't that interesting? That one looks like it might slide off the hippo. Just changing position. It's very peaceful around the water hole at the moment. I don't see any animals around here. Bit of a breeze over the over the dam. It's so nice, actually. Brian and I have really been uh, commenting on the heat this afternoon. Very, very hot. And we've got a question from Ramblin. Ramblin would like to know, can the hippo see underwater? Yes, they can indeed, Ramblin. They definitely can. Now, in parts of Africa, um, where, I mean, hippo are found throughout Africa, and in parts of Africa where there are very deep rivers, the hippos run on the bottom of the water holes or the rivers to get from one side to the other. And they will open their eyes and they can see very, very well underwater. And... As I said, they run on the bottom. They don't actually swim. The hippos 
don't necessarily swim. They, you may see some footage, if you're lucky, of hippos running and then what they do is they kick off the bottom of these riverbeds and they kick themselves up. They do kick their legs a bit but they're not actually swimming. Just to come up for air and then they'll go down and run again until they reach shallow water. They don't stay in deep water all the time. Usually it's an area that they can uh, either stand or lay down and just keep their head above the water to be able to breathe. And it's interesting, if you look now, we might see that hippo, his eyes and his ears, let's see the nostrils, where are the nostrils? There we go. Look how his head is flat there, that's perfect. What I wanted to point out is how all the important organs, uh, his sense organs, the, no the nostrils, the eyes and the ears are all situated quite flat right at the top of the head so that they're able to actually submerge completely and just keep that part of their body out of the water so they can hear, see and smell what's going on around them. It's a very interesting way the hippo have evolved over the years so that they can stay in the water and still be completely aware of what's going on around them. But can you see that? That's actually wonderful, a wonderful pose from this hippo. So Melinda has asked us a question about how much food a hippo must eat during the day. Melinda, it's hard to say because it can vary depending on the amount of food available. Hippo are grazers, so they feed on grass. And usually what happens is they move out of the water holes in the evenings. They'll move around and they'll go and feed they'll go and look for grass. At the moment there's very little grass around so this hippo probably covers quite a large distance in the evening to find food and I've read that they can cover anywhere between 5 and 10 kilometers in one night if they are looking for food when it is very dry and judging by this area at the moment there's not a lot of food around but with this green grass coming out the hippo's probably getting a bit more food. I'm not exactly sure how much it needs to eat though. I think it's between 20 and 50 kilograms of food a day, probably for a large hippo. But their digestive system is fairly efficient. Um, it's not like an elephant that need so much food to keep those animals going. Oh, some of the larger animals, the bulk feeders like rhino or buffalo, they need to constantly feed. Hippo will rest during the day and then only go out and feed at night. So it's not nearly as much as those other large animals that we get in the area. We're going to move on from the dam. There's not too much else going on yet just at the moment. So we're gonna drive around and see what else we can find. Maybe we can bump into some elephant this afternoon. That would be great. While we carry on our search, let's head back to Taylor for an update. We seem to be having a lot of luck with the buffalo this afternoon. And I'm completely sort of flabbergasted as to the fact that we're not seeing hordes of animals around the various watering points. If you could only feel how hot it really is here today and how humid it was, well if you were an animal you'd definitely be hanging around in the water. But just a couple of buffalo and not too many elephants, just those three that we saw earlier today, sorry those four that we saw earlier and not even a footprint of any others. So that's quite bizarre and that's something that I would really like to see of course is a beautiful big herd of elephants coming down to splish and splash. Now we didn't have any luck on finding in Kanyeni. I had a look for a footprints but she was on a serious mission uh, this morning and I'm not sure where she's disappeared to. So myself and David are actually making our way back towards Juma. But now you can see how desperate these animals are, how this buffalo has got its head tucked into the shrub. 
If you listen carefully, you hear a Deirdrix cuckoo calling. And that is definitely going to be a goal of mine over the next few weeks is to actually try and capture one of these cuckoos on camera. It seems as though there's not really much grass in that little fallen over terminalia. And this cow seems to be, oh not cow, it's a young bull, sorry, seems to be moving off now. Beautiful sounds though, all of a sudden. Very, very peaceful. And we're actually back at three in a row pan. Nothing really in the, the large amount of water, but we have just seen our buffalo again, who unfortunately, like I said, is not looking very well. I think we'll have one last look at this poor buffalo as we move along. And I think that by tomorrow morning, I don't think it will be around. You can see it kicking about a little bit. Very thin, <clears throat> very hot and uncomfortable. Very sad. Nature can be so cruel sometimes. Now, I know you're probably thinking, why on earth aren't we helping these animals? Sorry, I've got a bee here. The bee is gone now. Just came in to say hello. No, please don't come and sting us. And I know, Kim, you're wondering, why don't we help this buffalo? Now, where we are currently at the moment, we're in an open ecosystem. So basically, there is a big fence around the Greater Kruger area, but it's eight and a half million acres of land, which is a massive piece of land. And I apologize, I am looking into the sun. But um, it's very difficult for us to try and help these animals all the time. If we intervene constantly, then we do not let natural selection take place like it should. So droughts come along, they start to wipe out the herbivore populations, the carnivores obviously peak and they do very well. And then well in the greener season sometimes the tables can turn, the vegetation is not in the favour of the lions, they're not as well camouflaged with other various predators and of course all that green grass comes around and all these herbivores are able to regain their strength that they lost from the drier periods. And then we have diseases that come around and actually constantly control the predator populations. So the only time we will intervene, unfortunately, uh, or fortunately for the animals, is if it's an injury sustained because of human interference. So something like a snare, or perhaps if there were poachers around and an animal got injured, then we really are going to absolutely try and help it. Remember, remember yes, it's very sad that this buffalo is dying and probably won't last very much longer. But like I said, and it's something that you do have to understand, is that it's providing a meal for something else. You can hear the buffalo now slightly distressed. Sorry, I'm just having uh, looking at it and ducking from the sun. But I think let's move on from here and let this buffalo pass away in peace. No, we're not going anywhere. Wendy, please don't die on me. We're far away from home. Now, we're lucky that we had that other bouts of rain because it is going to give the animals a second chance of coming back after this drought period but we don't know when we're going to have the next set of rains again. We obviously we keep thinking with this high humidity that build, that's building up we're going to have to get rain soon. That's sort of the typical trend as it gets hot, hot, hot. It goes from a dry heat to a humid heat and then it normally lasts for about a week and then we get a big thunderstorm. And I really hope that that sort of happens. We don't have to have rain every single day. Ideally what we need out here is we need sort of constant rain. If we could get rain once a week or once every second week, about 20 mils of rain for the next couple of months, that would be amazing. It would just keep a constant growth of the grass and allow the grass to get nice and long. We haven't seen it once where the grass, well I haven't since I've been here seen it once when the grass has sort of got to a, a, a taller than our knees and we have had a fair amount of rain but the gaps between the rain has just been too big. The amounts that we've had, if they were closer together, definitely would have been enough to sort of fuel all the vegetation that's around. But even if you just have a look over here, the small amount of rain that Cheetah Plains did get 
is bringing some of that grass through now, but very slowly. Like I said, we had about 20 mils of rain a few nights ago. I'm not sure how much Cheetah Plains had. I don't think they had as much. Maybe they had whew, maybe about 10 mils of rain, but I don't think very more than that. It seems as though Biffle's Hook actually had the most of the rain. I believe they had about between 25 and 30, which is great for them. So they seem to be quite lucky. And you know, I'll tell you something very frustrating. When we were down, when I was guiding down in the southern sectors of the sand, the property was sort of a figure of eight, and we had a northern and a southern section. The southern section touching down on the Sabi River. And there, it was the most bizarre thing. I'm just going to stop here because I know that the signal gets a little bit patchy if we go up ahead. So we'd get these warnings on the radio, and I was guiding down on a lodge that was situated in the south. We get these warnings, basically uh, managing director saying, be careful, there's uh, lots of hail on its way, big thunderstorm, lightning, wind, you know, just be careful if you need to get back to a lodge when you can. And I'm good doing this, going, literally looking up to what we're seeing now, going, what on earth is everybody talking about? There's no rain, no clouds, no hail, no nothing. And in the north, guides would be racing back to the lodges, dodging thunder and lightning, trees that are blowing over in the roads, of course a couple of hail, stones falling down as well, and we drove around like there was nothing. And we were only maybe about, what, maybe a couple of kilometers from the northern sector where they were getting all the rain. So it's amazing how things like that happen and the weather becomes quite localized. Which, which way should we go? Okay, perfect. I'm just double checking that the, gremlin, the gremlins don't like to live around here. But maybe we'll go and have a look and see what's happening where the dam cam is. Maybe we'll get lucky and see some elephants around there. Now, chatting about sort of various animals that we haven't really been seeing in a while, and the question I think we had this morning as well was about the Styx lions. Now, I know Daniel from Scotland was wondering where have they been hiding out because we haven't really heard anything about them. Now, I'm not sure. I, like I said, I've only actually ever seen the Styx Pride once, and that was on my interview. Not on my interview drive, but the morning prior to that, I went out with Jamie and Jandre, and we went across to the Mala Mala boundary. And of course, we had the, I think they were actually on a kudu kill, and back then it was still all eight cubs. And unfortunately, since then, they have not survived. So I'm not sure where they're hiding around. I, I checked this, uh, the sort of areas that they said to have liked here on Cheetah Plains. And I haven't seen any footprints. I think I've only ever seen lion tracks once since I've come across to Cheetah Plains. And nothing yet. I'll probably have to try and get hold of maybe some of the Nkoro guards and see what they have to say. Because I know there was one lioness who had some new cubs, if I'm not mistaken. I think she had two. It'll be quite interesting to try and follow up and sort of see what's happening with them. So Daniel, I'll have to get on that and I'll have to get back to you about that question. Still just taking it easy, having a little scan around, seeing if there's not a leopard or anything perched up on some of these beautiful termite mounds that are in this area. My goodness. Now, I know we spoke about community nest spiders this morning, but I think that this is the biggest one I've ever seen. I just want to go back, and it was so beautiful the way that the sun was catching it. David, is that good? There we go. Look at how massive it is. That is a huge one. So if you remember from this morning, we had that long one. Hang on. Can you see the little caterpillar things? I need to jump out very quickly. Please excuse me while I hop out the vehicle. I want to go and collect a sample and see what's actually going on here. Because it looks very much like a, spy a spider hunting wasp. No, not that. Oh, and I'm taking my little blankets with me that help me sit higher in the chair. Not that I'm particularly short. I don't seem to sit very well. Let me go around quickly. I'm going to try and figure out what's going on over here. Now I suppose I need a stick. Hey, huh? you get a little stick to capture. Where are those little worms that we saw moving, David? No, they are. 
Oh, what is this? Maybe there were little worms. I'm going to try and get one out. I'm going to bring it towards you. I'm just having a quick little look around here. So, hang on, hang on, here's a live one. This one's been eaten. Caterpillar, it's your lucky day. Now this is quite bizarre. I'm going to come around and show you. Now, if you look at this web firstly, you see how it's sort of blowing in the wind? Firstly, the silk is quite amazing. It's really strong and quite a few birds actually use it to make their nests out of it. Now, if I turn it like that, can you see those caterpillars a little bit better? They just it's stuck inside the web. One is dead, which I presume has been eaten by the community nest spiders. And the other one, well, I'm not sure. I'm just going to turn it towards me so I can have a closer look and then a little in investigation. So perhaps they drop down. I just want to see what trees are behind me from one of these bush willows. Maybe they're the larvae of some form of a butterfly and they were feeding on the bush willows and then unfortunately got stuck in the web of the community nest spider. Now there were lots of them in there but unfortunately all dead and wrapped up in silk. Let's see if this one is still alive. Barely. I think it has been trapped in that web for quite some time. You can see it there as it stretches. I mean, hold this silk a little bit. My hands are absolutely filthy from what I've been doing today. I must apologize. You can see that little worm. Okay. Well, it's good for the spiders, of course. It's another opportunity that these insects, um, we've seen an abundance of caterpillars and flies and alates at the moment. And as great as what they are, they need to start obviously pupating or burying underground, starting new colonies for themselves. It also gives, of course, the opportunities for the spiders, for any of the other insects that, of course, feed on these other little critters, an opportunity to sort of succeed as well. And sort of, well, I think we'll probably put this guy back. Though I don't think it's going to survive. I think I might leave you on this. Let's see if I can save this little caterpillar. It's got so much silk on it. And I think it is tired and weak from being in the sun. Here we go. Little caterpillar, I'm going to put it down here. Oh, a little leaf, hang on, what on earth are you? Wait, I'm going to pick something for you very quickly. It's astounding what you can find when you stick your head in a bush. What is that? Can you see that, Darby? Isn't that a crazy looking thing? It's fluffy and I'm going to need your assistance again. Please, can you take some screenshots for me? And you can either hashtag Safari Live and add it to Twitter or you can email it to us, questions at wildearth.tv. And I am collecting all the photos that you're sending me, so please don't think I'm not using them. I'm just waiting for a book that I can find to actually be able to identify these things. Now I want to turn it around and just have another look for myself. That is a bizarre looking caterpillar. Hey, isn't that incredible? Very hairy. It almost looks like it's got two antennae coming from the top of its head. What an outstanding little critter. We've been very lucky with, I suppose, with all the various insects. Now I need to put you back. Thank you for being so wonderful. You can stay there. Now let me jump back in. So many different little creatures around at the moment. You know, just when you think that you've got the knack of the bush and you figured out what all the little critters are or the plants are something new pops up and surprises you and that's what we love is that you're constantly learning right we're going to go through a little bit of a dodgy signal patch now so i think we're going to jump across back onto byron's vehicle away from Biffles Hook Dam. Haven't seen too much. Oh, look at everybody quickly. Sorry, there's a little Steenbok. There we go. Wonderful, a little Steenbok, the smallest antelope in this area. And that's a little male. Oh, wonderful. He's hiding behind the tree a little bit. I don't want to move again because I'm scared I startle him and he moves. Oh, there we go. Beautiful view of him. They're usually in pairs, so there's very possibly a female around this area somewhere. 
and they're one of the small antelope, one of the antelope species that mate for life. The pair generally stay together, obviously unless the one of the two die, then they will go and find another mate, but they do end up staying together and in the same territory. Oh, look here, everybody. We've got a very interesting bird just off to our right. Brian will scan across. Have a look at this. Right here on the termite mound. Look at that. That's a Koki Franklin. How beautiful is that? He may call again. I just heard one calling in the distance. There we go. What a wonderful sound. And these are very secretive little Franklins. I'm so glad we got to see it. <laughs> Thankfully, I don't have to try and mimic the sound because it's calling right next to us. <laughs> that is wonderful. You often hear them, but they're tricky to see because they are small. This one has decided to stand right on top of the termite mound. And this is possibly a, a territorial call uh, and trying to attract a mate. This is a male. I just want to find in my book quickly um, why I say it's a male and... What the, I'll show you what the females look like, but let's watch him for a little bit longer. This is a wonderful sighting. You don't often get to see them, like I said, so it's really nice to see those beautiful colors. Very noisy little bird for its size. James has asked an interesting question. James would like to know, do all the Franklins have similar diets? Um, or do is there slight variation to avoid competition? There is a slight variation, but generally, generally they do all feed on seeds. Some will even feed on insects. Um, but uh, little, some of the larger ones, the crested and the uh, and the Swainson's spur fowls also fall into this family. They'll feed on um, on some uh, fruit uh, bulbs, uh, you know, little little roots and bulbs and seeds, even insects. These little Koki Franklin, they'll feed uh, mostly on seeds, shoots, and um, and and some little fruit. But what I want to show you is quickly the difference between the male and the female. Let me just show you here quickly. Look at this. So I've got the book open to the Koki Franklin. There it is. And you can see this is the male with the beautiful red head. And look at the female. A bit of white on the throat area and around that eye. Very different neck compared to the male. The body looks the same, but the head is different. So it's so nice to be able to see this male so close to us. Let's carry on watching him. If you were a photographer, you'd love this because it's beautiful light. William has asked, is there anyone calling back to him? There is indeed, William, and that's why I was saying that I'm sure it's going to call again. I can hear in the distance at least two calling back. So there are quite a few Koki Franklin in this area. And I'm sure they're all giving their territorial call.
this really is wonderful. This is one of the best sightings I've had of, the, of one of these Koki Franklins because often they just move off. They run into the scrub, into the long grass and they disappear very, very quickly. <laughs> Calling non-stop. And one was calling back. I think it's a little too far for you to hear, but there is one calling in the distance. The, the other one has just called. So they're completely answering one another and possibly saying, this is my territory, you need to leave. And I think the other male is saying the same. But it's an incredible sound, isn't it, for this little bird? <laughs> I think uh, why don't we leave this male to continue his territorial calls and let's go see what else we can find but wasn't that wonderful such a nice surprise watching a little stenbok and all of a sudden this Franklin started calling right next to us it was nice to see that stenbok too often they run away very quickly and he did get a bit of a fright in the beginning but then stopped and we got a lovely view of him Oh, the temperature is starting to cool a little bit. This breeze when you're driving is lovely. Yes, Andrina has just said that she thinks that's the best sighting of a Koki Franklin to date. So I'm so happy about that. That's wonderful. That's good news. I've been really enjoying the birding over the last few days, the last week that I've been here. And I'm sure it will continue. There's some impala around in front of us. Moving across the road. We've been seeing a lot of impala. Wonderful, wonderful antelope to have around. Elegant and dainty. And look how agile they are too. I mean, if you see them running at full speed, it's incredible. There's a few off to our left in the thicket, just behind the termite mound. I think let's carry on and just see what else we can find. It's always nice to see the impala, but we have been seeing a lot of them around. So it's nice to also just see them, leave them so we don't disturb them too much. Hang on, there we go. And buffalo off to the left. And while we're watching this buffalo, I got an answer to that question about that black spot on the zebra's leg. And Belinda has said that the black spot is apparently called a chestnut and it's remnant of ancestors of zebras. Um, it used to be a toe apparently. That's very interesting. Thank you so much Belinda because I did not know that. So it's called a chestnut. We've been seeing a lot of buffalo around. And the buffalo haven't been too lucky the last week or so. The lions have been preying on them. And they've been very successful. The lions have got a buffalo almost every day for the last five or six days. At least one buffalo a day. Some days they've been three or four. And I think uh, we, we've been speaking about it and because we've coming out of a drought and we still need a lot of rain, we need a lot of vegetation to grow, but these buffalo have been weakened because there isn't a lot of food. So they're not in great condition and I think it's become a bit easy for the lions to hunt them. 
you can actually see the ribs on that buffalo still exposed but there's a lot more grass so I'm pretty soon I'm pretty sure that soon they will start looking a lot better and they'll gain their their health back and strength Look at those very sharp horns. Buffalo are able to defend themselves very well with those horns. And they can be fairly aggressive if they do feel threatened. So I know I am very careful when walking in the bush because of these buffalo around. Because they can be quite unpredictable. But uh, not just me. You know, Even lions when they are hunting them, they've got to be so careful. Because those horns and the power of the buffalo can cause some serious dam damage and I, I've heard of many occasions where lions have been killed by buffalo. Usually what happens if the lions hunt a herd and the herd run away but then turn, and I've seen it before where the whole herd turns around, comes back and actually chases the lions off or chases them into a tree. Can you believe it? Alright, so Taylor's back on Juma. Look at that sunset though. A beautiful sunset this afternoon. Clear skies, lovely silhouette of those trees. And let's just sit here for another minute just to enjoy that. Isn't that beautiful? Listen to the... I'm not sure if you can hear that. Koki Franklin is still calling. Can you believe it? Still calling in the distance. But what a beautiful, beautiful sky. Just behind those few clouds. You really have had a wonderful afternoon. Lions and the buffalo and zebra and wildebeest, hippo in the water. We've seen so much. It's been a nice flowing drive. It really has been great. Interesting birds along the way. <laughs> so we're going to carry on moving. Still enjoying the sunset, and uh, as I mentioned, Taylor's back on Juma now. So let's get an update from her and see what she's got. So our plan now, we're changing it up a little bit, and it's actually David's suggestion is that, oh sorry, there's quite a few corrugations over here, let me go a little bit slower, is that he suggested why don't we go and do a sunset cruise and I think that is so fitting as soon as you've just seen the sunset. Now we're going to head on down into this little dip and then we're going to carry on and well we'll see who else is out and about. I suspect, I'm hoping that we're going to see a couple of animals along here just because it's been so hot today as we keep stressing about and of course it's nice and cool down in the drainage. So we'll just turn in here and have a little look-see. Right, into 4x4 four four we go. Go Wendy. Not allowed to get sick now when we're in the drainage line. And of course this is really lovely to see so many different types of trees and maybe we'll get lucky and find that elusive cuckoo which we have been looking after and uh, looking for I look not looking after and actually let's take a moment to just appreciate the sounds of the cicadas Isn't that absolutely lovely? The turtle doves shouting work harder and then of course that high-pitched buzz that you get from the cicadas. Now it's actually not too bad this evening. I thought it was going to be a little bit louder than that. But when you're sitting in and amongst them on either side I suppose the sound can reach about 130 decibels which is very very loud. 
let's go along here and see who we've got. Come on, Wendy. You can do it. She just rearranged my blankets that I'm sitting on. I find that quite funny that I need to sit on blankets because I'm not particularly short. I'm actually quite tall. But I don't know the... Wendy seems to have a sunken seat and I sink right down in it and then you can barely see my head over the back seat of the chair. So they put me on blankets to raise me up. I think I need one of those baby boosters, you know, when you go to the cinemas and your child needs to see a bit higher than the chairs. I think I need to get, uh, get one of those and then perhaps sit in that. Now it's a pity that the fruit on all these beautiful jackalberries that we're seeing along this river have disappeared so quickly. But if you remember correctly, this is actually the jackalberry where we watched the other morning a, a go-away bird that was feeding on a couple of fruits that were still left, but they weren't ripe just yet. Now I can hear a Deirdrick's cuckoo. I'm just going to have a quick scan for it. Where are you? Sounds like it could possibly be behind me. I want to jump out of the Mulwati very quickly and just go have a look. I'm dying to get this bird on camera. And maybe if I try hard enough, maybe we will. It's uh, out of 4x4. We don't need to be in that anymore. Now I think it's the same one that we heard calling earlier today because it seems to be in the same spot. Maybe it's living around here. Let's see if we can find it. Now I wonder if it's not sitting in this big lead wood over here. A couple of starlings flying out of it, but I can't see the cuckoo just yet. But this basically sounded like where it was coming from, and now it is of, has of course stopped calling. But actually, look what I've got for you. Can you see that weaver sitting on the tree behind us? Now, this is something I haven't... Well, I've seen them very quickly. Oh, <laughs> and well, that's how you know we're live, is that when we desperately try and show you a bird, but before we can even get there, it's flown away. But it was indeed a southern masked weaver. Now, let's have a look. I'm sure you've seen plenty of weavers before. They make those beautiful nests. Let's quickly go to Weaver. Now it's a long list of birds. Southern Mast, 420. I'm going to go right to the back of the book. And there's quite a few of them that we see in this area. You can see over here on the left hand side of the page that is the Southern Masked Weaver. Now they can be easily be confused. If you go to the right, the lesser masked weaver, now there's two birds they can be confused with, but you can see that the mask of the lesser masked weaver goes a little bit over the crown of the head and it doesn't have that red eye. And then if, of course if you go to the top, the village weaver, this for me is always tough to try and get them sort of right. You can see that the male, if you go further to the right of the page, has also got a red eye. But can you see how that black mask sort of cuts right above the top of the eye and doesn't go so high above the... I'm just trying to point over there. You see how it's lacking the crown, the black crown, whereas you see that mask completely covering the face on the southern masked weaver on the left. Right, but that's just hopefully that will help you when trying to identify them. This is obviously only if you have a really good look at them. And it's understandable if you do get those three birds confused at a quick glance if you don't get to see the eye color but it seems as though that cuckoo does not want to be want to be found just yet it's fine I'm patient cuckoos I'll get you eventually right let's go around I think I'm gonna keep out of the Mulwachi just for now just because I know there's a little bit of a spot that uh, is we have a flat tire oh <laughs> David looked concernedly down towards the tire and I thought we may have had a flat tire, but we don't. And let's go back across to Byron and catch the last of the sunset with him. This is an incredible sunset, Taylor. I hope you can see it where you are. I know you've gone down into the drainage line, but an 
absolutely beautiful sunset. Nice bit of cloud cover and always helps having the clouds around. And I always chat about it and mention, you know, this is usually when we'd stop our drive with our guests and get out, stretch the legs a little bit and have some refreshments. Uh, so if you're at home watching wherever you are around the world, maybe get yourself something to drink and enjoy the sunset with us. It's so relaxing, so peaceful. There's a nice little cool breeze that's just picked up, the temperature's dropped, it's very peaceful. A few birds calling in the distance, a Cape turtle dove, really is wonderful. And you know, stopping like this at times also helps a lot to find animals because we might hear something. Maybe the call of a leopard, a territorial call or, a, or an alarm call from some antelope or birds or monkeys. We could potentially find something else. And also, the amount of times I've stopped um, for our sundowners or just to enjoy a sunset or a sunrise and something's wandered out of the bush. Oh, I can hear some zebra. Don't know if you all got to hear that, but there was some zebra calling in the distance. A little bit far away. Uh-huh, 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 uh-huh. <laughs> Son of a zebra. <laughs> I have got some other good news though. My dear old friend James is back. He's returned from his leave. So he'll be back on safari with us from tomorrow. It's great to have him back. He looks well rested. And um, sounds like he enjoyed his birthday and his time off. So I'm sure all of you are also excited to have him back. And. I'm sure we're going to have some more fun of the next week or so that I'm still here too. And look what's just landed in the tree next to us. A vulture. It's just got its head tucked away. A white-backed vulture. Enjoying the sunset with us. Well, that sun is just dropping now on the horizon. Have a look at that. Oh, really incredible. That mountain range that it's dropping behind is called the Drakensberg Mountain Range. It's the largest mountain range which stretches almost right across South Africa. But look how quickly that sun drops. Once it gets to something that we can um, see it against, you really notice how quickly it moves. It gives good perspective. And gone. That color will probably stay in the sky for quite some time. Beautiful orangey red. Wasn't that lovely? So great to sit and just watch the sun go down. So peaceful, so relaxing. Uh, we're going to carry on in our search for anything interesting. And while I do that, let's get another update from Taylor. 
Now that sunset looks absolutely beautiful this afternoon. I'm just getting a couple of snippets of it between all the trees. Unfortunately, we don't have a clear view of it. And I'm envious that you got to watch it. So hopefully you all took a couple of good screenshots that I can go back and have a look at. Now we're currently on our way towards the Juma Pan, so you can have a look and I shall pretend to be the dam cam for a little bit longer, but we're not too far, we're probably only a few hundred meters away, so this is going to be quite exciting and then we'll also be able to have a look and see how nice and green the grass is. Just checking around here, and I wonder when Karula is going to come back with her little ones, it would be so nice to see her back in the area again. Maybe tomorrow morning. Let's see if I dream about leopards tonight. Though I am also missing the Nkuhumas, so I suspect I'm probably going to have to try and find them again at some point in the next couple of days. My leopard streak has been absolutely wonderful. But I think it's time for a change and hopefully we'll see some lions. You all know how much I love those Nkuhumas. Now, I believe, and I'm so excited that we're on day 50 of our cat streak. Isn't that absolutely incredible? And I loved how we weren't seeing any leopards at all for quite a few days, and then we got to see four different leopard in such a short space of time, in two days. Isn't that incredible? Right, we've arrived, we're almost there, and I can see lots and lots of wildebeest on the lovely green plains, just sort of south of the dam. Let's have a little closer look. I'm going to reposition ourselves. And I wonder if Henry is around. Henry, are you here today? Look at how stunning this is. I'm just going to go up a bit further. Get us a nice spot that we can look back onto these wildebeest. Isn't this stunning? With of course that beautiful light that's sitting at the back in the distance. And then, of course, all these wonderful wildebeest that are walking around. Now, it almost looks like they're all walking uphill, but don't worry, it's just sort of the gradient of the ground. And this is one of the bigger herds of wildebeest we, well, I've seen since I've been here. We've seen a couple herds, but sort of few and far between. So it's quite nice to see all these females and, of course, a couple or one impala. Lost in amongst the wildebeest. Looks like it's looking for the rest of its herd. There's a couple at the back. And to whichever male wildebeest lives in this area, well, he must be smiling from ear to ear. Having all these lovely ladies around him. There's even a couple of guinea fowl further to the left, where the logs are. There's so many different animals here. And for a change, the guinea fowl are being quiet. You can see they're all grooming themselves, doing one last forage before the sun sets, and then I suspect they're going to pick a tree and fly up to it and roost there for the evening. You can see all the wildebeest again, all the youngsters, and all the females look like they're getting rather large bellies. And I wonder which animal species it's going to be first this year, that we're going to see the first baby. Is it going to be a wildebeest? Is it going to be an impala? I wonder what your guesses are. I'd like to hear what guesses you think as to who we're going to see the first baby of the season from. Whether it's a zebra, wildebeest, impala, kudu, you name it. I suspect, I think it's going to be, hmm, this is a tough one. I want to say impala because they're the most abundant, but then I also want to say a zebra because sometimes they're sneaky. And they can have their foals a little bit earlier. I'm going to go with the zebra. I think we're going to see a baby zebra, a foal, that will be the first one. That's lovely. I'm going to move up towards the dam though. Let's see what's going on inside there. Mm, there's a couple of beautiful big water buck which we're going to have a look at as well. They're standing right up along the fence though.
let's have a look at those water buck in the distance, especially that big male that's now turning towards us. Oh my goodness, look at those horns. Now, if you're watching for the first time and you're wondering what on earth that fence is at the back there, that is just a very small electric fence that is going around one of the lodges to try and keep as many of the larger animals out as possible, but it doesn't always work. I'm pretty sure that all, most of the antelope could actually just jump over the top of that fence if they really wanted to. They're very athletic and are able to leap over quite a few different things. Though I wouldn't imagine too many antelope species would want to go in there. However, the Inyala and, and Bushbuck that often feed on all the vegetation around uh, the lodges and they become quite easily habituated, they often pop inside. But like I said, they've got springy legs and they're able to jump over. Now, that's quite interesting to see two big males. This one that we're looking at now, though, looks much larger. And there's actually even a third one. A little bit further to the left. There he is there, and he looks like a giant. Look at him. My goodness, that is a big waterback. Now, I wonder if there aren't a couple of females around, and that's why they're hanging around, slowly moving in, and they will probably start the courtship process and fighting amongst each other. But I think what we're going to do now, is we're going to go back across to Byron, who I believe has an elephant. I do indeed have some elephants, and we actually mentioned it not too long ago. I said maybe we bump into a herd of elephant, and we have. And I'm so happy. Sun has set, and they're moving through these thickets, feeding. There's a few of them around. What I'm going to do is, I think this road bends a little bit to the bottom. Uh, and just there's a little bit of a dip in front of us, I should say. And then I think it bends a little bit to the left. So let's go have a look and see if we can't see the rest of this herd. But isn't that a lovely surprise? It looks like a, fe a few females with some younger elephant. But I didn't see the rest of the herd. They've moved, like I said, down into this drainage line. Let's see if we can't get a glimpse of them. Ah, yes, there we go. I see a few of you hiding in here. Wonderful. Oh. Look at this everyone, oh, there's a whole herd, look at that, wonderful. Andrew's just asked, what happens when the matriarch of the herd dies, um, who will then become the next matriarch. So there is a hierarchy. It is most likely a, an elephant that is related to the matriarch, perhaps one of her offspring that's old enough, or maybe even a sister of that matriarch. The oldest and wisest within the herd usually becomes the matriarch. Oh, wonderful. Hang on, let's, let's follow, follow them a little bit more. Not moving too quickly. We'll get a nice view, I think, just down here. We might get a nice view of them. Again, just make sure there's not another one coming behind us. I don't see any. I seem to be enjoying all this vegetation down in this drainage line. Oh, sorry, I'm just going to edge forward slowly and not to disturb them but they seem happy with us being around here there we go isn't this fantastic my absolute favorite to be able to sit and watch elephant like this i'm so happy oh this is really fantastic some youngsters here a lot of females and the younger elephant in all ages and sizes oh that little one just having a look at us. Teenager, it looks like. Another younger elephant there. It's interesting to see when these elephants go and feed. As soon as the adults head to one tree, usually the younger elephants follow. 
and they'll go and feed on the same tree and I think that's how they learn it's part of the learning process they'll follow the adults and learn from them that one dropping dung so the elephant digestive system is not very efficient so a lot of food they feed on passes straight through them it's a young male and they only absorb about if I'm not mistaken it's about 30 percent of all the food that they actually eat so that dung is very very coarse and you can see a lot of plant material grass branches bark leaves you can see the flies and little midges are around that dung already it's incredible how quickly they all but look there you can see sticks everything in that dung some of the some of the food passes right through and we'll see fairly shortly Watch this young male. No, nah, he's relaxed, just backing up a little bit. So we'll see very soon. We'll, we're going to start getting all the marula fruit on the marula trees um, as we move into summer. And elephants love it. They absolutely love it. We can eat it too. Rich in vitamin C, very tasty. But why I'm mentioning it is because the elephants love it so much, when they feed on that marula fruit, you'll often find piles of elephant dung completely full of of the uh, marula fruit and some of them pass straight through haven't even been crushed down or bitten into they literally just swallow them and they pass straight through the digestive system you might get other animals will come and feed on that again so uh, especially monkeys and baboons bird species perhaps will come and feed on those marula fruit Yeah, you know, interesting comment by William. He was saying it's it's interesting to see how that elephant avoided stepping in his own dung. It was interesting, William. And um, you know they are very very aware. Oh, there's a little dung beetle on there already, right in the middle. I thought I saw a little dung beetle walk down. There's some flies on there too. See those big flies? I'm sure I saw a little dung beetle just walk right underneath that pile of dung. So yes, William, very interesting to see that elephant avoid its dung and not step in it. Samantha has asked us, do the elephants migrate out of this area uh, sometimes during the year? No, Samantha, they don't. And the reason is uh, because we are in a game reserve which is protected and it is fenced, but it is a very large area. As I was saying, it's roughly around 7 million acres of land that we are situated in. So it is a huge area. But in southern Africa, we don't have migrations because there's generally always enough food and enough water for the animals they don't have to migrate these elephants don't have to up in east africa and other parts of africa the elephants do migrate to an extent to go and look for food and look for water depending on the dry seasons and where the food is available so here no they don't but in other parts of africa yes they do It's going to move forward a little bit again and see if we can't get another view of them from this side. They're slowly moving around. They've spread out a little bit more. Uh, Bush Mum has just said, what a lovely and gentle way to end the drive. So good for the soul and I could not agree with you more. Look at this little one. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? It's been a great way to end. We had a beautiful sunset, very calm, peaceful sunset. And now this herd of elephant completely relaxed and feeding around us. This little one gave half an attempt at a trumpet. 
just breathing quite heavily through its trunk. It's so funny, sometimes you get quite a reaction from these little ones. They do react to the vehicles and they try and show off a little bit. Now I've seen them come rushing out and shaking their ears and then quickly turn around and see if mom is still behind them. <laughs> They're quite brave when the adult females are close by and then they usually just scurry off again. Trying to keep quiet so you can hear. I hope you can hear some of these branches breaking and these elephants picking off the leaves. It's lovely to hear these sounds. We've got a few birds calling in the distance, giving their last calls for the, for the afternoon or for the evening. Oh, listen to that. Some Franklin, some. Uh, sounded like some arrow mark babblers. Yeah, we're sitting in a drainage line and there's no breeze down here, so it's very, very warm still. Temperature is quite hot. Isn't this wonderful? So great just to be able to sit here and spend time with the elephant. I promise you this is one of my happiest moments, just enjoying the bush and letting things happen around us. It really is fantastic and I do enjoy it. And it's so great that we are able to show you this and uh, that you can join us and send your comments and questions through. I've always said this is a very different experience for me. I still guide a lot of guests around and I'm used to everybody being on the vehicle with me. So it's a little bit easier because you don't have to describe every little thing because they can look around, see, smell, touch. And, and it's interesting to be able to describe what we are experiencing through a camera and through to all our viewers. It's nice that you are still being able to see it and you can hear it. But uh, being here is very different. Just having a look, just constantly watching the herd, just making sure. But they are so relaxed, they're not worried about us at all, completely comfortable. There's still one or two feeding off to, to our right. And a slowly moving up this little embankment, looking for some more food. And they'll constantly feed throughout the night. I'll just carry on feeding. You can imagine they need a lot of food to keep those large bodies going. And we've spoken about it before. Some of these big males will eat up to 250 or 300 kilograms of food a day, which is amazing if you think of how much plant material that actually is. Nina, thank you so much for your comment. You said you'd love to have me as a guide. Well, that would be great. Maybe one day I can take all of you on safari. Look how that elephant's rolling that branch in its mouth and stripping the bark off and feeding on the bark. Look at that view. Just lovely with these beautiful big trees around us. There's still a little bit of light in the sky. 
the remains of that wonderful sunset that we had. All these wonderful silhouettes around us. Isn't that incredible? We're gonna, going to continue. I'm going to get the spotlight out and see what we can find with the spotlight. While I do that, Taylor's still at Juma Pan. Uh, over your telepan, let's see what she's got. I was hoping we were going to see Henry the hippo when we initially first got here, but as you can see, he's not around at the moment. He's probably been out, already gone out for an early dinner. But I think what we're going to do is we're going to leave the dam cam. Doesn't seem to be too much happening here at the moment. Actually, look at the guinea fowl, how they've gone up to the top of that knob thorn. Now one has already flown up, look at these two looking. Let's see if they're going to fly up and start the roost as well. They're thinking about it. Goodness gracious. And some elephants shouting in the very far distance. So there's a guinea fowl up on top of that knob thorn. There it goes, look. There we go, starting a trend. The two are up there now and I suspect that the third guinea fowl, there it goes. Up it goes. See, they fly exactly like chickens. Not very well. It's not graceful like an eagle, unfortunately. But they can only do the best with what they've got. And well, they don't need to fly far. They just need to be able to get away quickly, I suppose, if something is chasing them. And to be able to fly just a couple of meters off the ground, well, that's perfect. And this is where I think that they're going to sleep tonight. It's getting settled in quite nicely. Here we go, guinea fowl. That's a lovely branch to sit on. Right. Well, we're going to carry on now. I'm also going to get the spotlight out. Oh, I'm so glad, Fran and Linda, that you have reminded me. I completely forgot. Right, now, remember yesterday I was telling you about how we should do leopard impersonations. Right, now, I've been dying to do this, and it keeps sort of sort of popping out of my mind which is frustrating so we're going to do it now and we need to challenge Byron too so whew, <clears throat> let me get prepared for this even David stretching his neck out a bit there right let's just make sure now I'm gonna attempt to do the rasping of a leopard be interesting to see what you think are you ready is your volume turned up nice and loud <laughs> What did you think? I got a round of applause to David. David, I would have preferred a standing ovation. No, I'm just teasing. I'm being cheeky now. Ah, thank you, Kirsty. Kirsty says I get 10 out of 10. Now, <laughs> that was my grand finale, and I hope you had a wonderful time with us this afternoon. And luckily, we managed to get a little sneak peek of quarantine before he disappeared. Well, and hopefully I'll see you bright and early tomorrow morning on the Sunrise Drive. But from myself and David, have a lovely evening, morning, night, afternoon, lunchtime, wherever you may be in the world. But let's go back across to Byron, who I know also wants to say goodbye. So I just heard a leopard call everybody. It sounds like it's quite close by. I'm just joking. That was Taylor's attempt at a leopard. <laughs> well, apparently it sounded quite good. So uh, I know she's challenged me. So let's see if I can do a quick leopard call for you. So I'm obviously going to do a male leopard. <laughs> And I, I think, like I said, I think my, my lion and leopard calls are a bit better than my bird calls. So male leopard call, walking, territorial call. How's that? <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> Yeah, I think Kirsten's a bit biased. She gave me a 6 out of 10 and Taylor 10 out of 10. Oh dear. Oh dear.
and River has just sent me a wonderful comment. River, thank you so much. He said, I'm your favorite. Thank you, River. And I'm glad you're enjoying Safari Live with us. And it is wonderful that you can watch. And River's age nine. It's so great that young kids are able to enjoy it with us. I'm trying to look for a chameleon just before we run out of time. But thank you so much to everybody. I hope you've enjoyed the afternoon with us again really has been great I've enjoyed it it's been hot but it has been fun and that's the most important thing as long as we have a bit of fun out there while we're doing this it's great scanning very very carefully maybe an owl or anything just before the show ends um, a big thank you to the ladies in FC Kirsten and Lou thanks ladies and the voices in my head it's always great having you backing us up back at the FC and uh, always a big thank you to Brian and the thumb thank you Mr. Hedgehog <laughs> this afternoon and don't forget to join us on our safari, our sunrise safari tomorrow morning again. And James will be back, which is exciting. Thank you, everybody. Good night and goodbye, and we'll see you tomorrow.